Hi friends, today's focus in the deep dive is on sharing your spiritual story, sharing your faith story. And if the truth is told, I don't think anyone really wants to hear my faith story. It's not particularly dramatic. I have no Damascus Road experience. I have nothing inspiring about it. Burning bushes were never part of my story. I think it'd be rather boring. So who really cares? I've never written much of my story, but come to think of it, when I have on occasion shared a reflection about even a snippet of my journey, my unremarkable story in God's remarkable hands connects with people. It connects somehow beyond my imagination or understanding. My conversation partner may feel a connection with God or may feel a connection with the church or may simply feel a connection with me. But within the story, there's a parallel to his or her own story. And that may be the value in our telling the stories that we have close to our own hearts. Remember the definition of discipleship, continuously and intentionally becoming more Christ-like and introducing others to Christ. We took a vow when we joined the church to be a witness, a voice for Jesus Christ. Will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Will you then tell others how God has been at work in your life? That's all it means to be a witness, to share your faith story. Tell others how God has been at work in your life. I learned early, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I never really questioned it. Sometimes my questions ran along a different track, like Jesus loves me, this I know, but does Jesus really love the prickly and pouting or the pushy and power hungry people of the world? Well, you know the answer to that is yes. Yes, of course, Jesus loves them too. And a part of the answer is that I should stick to my own faith story rather than judging anyone else's. So back to that story. Even as I confess that I have done little to record or to reflect on my own faith story, I do enjoy reading and hearing about how other people have experienced God in ordinary circumstances as well as in the wow moments of life. Within the last week, Tom Morris, you know that name, one of our friends at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, shared a memory on his Facebook post. And if I could pull it up for you and share it with you now, you'd find in it the most fascinating story about how God was so very present at the time of an accident involving his wife and daughter and granddaughter. So here's the story as Tom posted it. He's describing some of the blessings he's received in life. Blessings. My wife and I were reflecting on our blessings last night and we remembered a very serious accident she, our daughter and granddaughter were in several years ago. They were delivering a casserole across town to a friend who had cancer. I was in Sundance, Utah, giving a speech. After the talk, I was back in my remote cabin when I got a photo on my phone of my daughter's SUV beat up and on its side on a four lane road. I had spotty internet access and couldn't talk to anyone despite repeated attempts. We're okay, we think. A message finally came through email from my daughter who had been the driver, but it looked bad. They had been on a busy road in front of Screen Gems Film Studios in rush hour traffic and were T-boned by a white truck. It spun them around, flipped them over, skidding them into oncoming traffic, totaled. Cars barely missed them. Two pulled over fast. A young man jumped out of his car and dashed over to the overturned SUV and leaped into the upturned side. There was a strong 
and threatening smell of gas. He pulled on the front door that now faced the sky. It would not yield. He could see the three passengers hanging from seatbelts inside and broken glass everywhere. One was a young child in a car seat in the back. He managed to use superhuman strength to wrench the door open and somehow got far enough in to begin extracting my wife, daughter, and granddaughter one by one from the dangerous situation. He was fighting time in imminent danger. As he lifted them through the door, he handed each to another man who had run from his own car. A third man then came up to my wife, who seemed the most seriously hurt. He was a movie medic from Screen Gems, and he was the guy who had run into them. He apologized profusely as he began to check everyone's injuries and insist that they go straight to the hospital. There was a worry about internal injuries. I didn't know anything of all this, but it looked bad. I got on the phone over and over with my spotty cell phone service and finally got to a travel person to tell me I'd never make it to Salt Lake City in time for the next flight south and that anyway, it was completely booked. Well, I'm gonna fast forward. He made it, barely, by the skin of his teeth and boarded and was in a full plane. But he got to Atlanta. And when he was in Atlanta, it looked like he would never make it onto the next flight to Wilmington. Well, he made it. And finally, he was able to arrive in Wilmington and got home and met the family. The wife, daughter, and baby were there without serious injuries, just cuts and scratches and muscle damage that would take at least a year or two to heal. I went out to get dinner for them at one of the many restaurants near our neighborhood. I was in the front of the place at the hostess stand, waiting for the salads and other stuff and telling the whole story to a mesmerized group of people when a young man came in the door, just as I related the part about the guy who had jumped out onto the car to rescue my family. And he looked shocked and said, that was me. What? The assistant manager of the restaurant, late for his shift from saving my family. He got a profuse thanks and a big hug and a bigger tip. And I told his story to a local audience soon afterwards, and he got another big tip from the president of that company, and he got promoted to manager, and everyone in the end was okay. So that goes on my gratitude list for a long time. And thank you, Tom, for the story. It's interesting, isn't it, that in this story, he doesn't mention the name of God, but he doesn't need to because God's activity, God's hand was involved from start to finish. And you can see it. You can feel it. You can celebrate it. That's a story. And it reminds me of how wonderfully God works in all of our lives. And all the stories don't end that way but it's exciting to see, and it's a matter that, that continues to fuel our faith as we recognize God's involvement in all of our lives. And as men and women of faith, we have a story. Colorful or not, it's a story of God's reliable presence, of God's providential care, of God's power to transform our lives. As I was preparing for the study today, I went back to some of the works of John Wesley, the founder of Methodist movement in the 18th century in England. He was not known for moving the faith needle in anyone's life in his early years. In fact, you may recall that he made a journey to, uh, from England to the American colony at Georgia in 1735. And his intention was to convert the savages. Well, good intentions, but the wrong approach. Not only was his language not politically correct, he was in fact operating with a savior complex on steroids. Little surprise then, the mission was a disaster. Wesley's failure was for him a crisis of faith. And he left Georgia a very broken man. And by God's grace, he then fell under the influence of the Moravian Christians who tried to restore his hope that God was not finished with him. And it's interesting to note that 
Wesley said little about faith experiences in his life, except for two events in his life. The first occurred when he was about five years old. And you may recall that John was one of 15 children of Samuel and Susanna Wesley. And I don't know exactly how many were in the home on the night when the house caught fire. But it was a dramatic experience. It looked like everyone escaped harm and all were accounted for until they realized John was not with them. Then his mother saw him in an upstairs bedroom window and realized that he still was in danger and could easily perish in the fire. Jackie, as she called him, was rescued. And his mother always maintained that he was saved for some purpose that God would reveal to him. Well, the second personal experience of faith that he mentioned over and over again occurred after his mission to Georgia. And he described an occasion when his heart was strangely warmed. He was listening to the word as it was interpreted and understood and read at a prayer meeting at Aldersgate Street. The year was 1738. It was a full year after his return from Georgia. And he received there the assurance of salvation. And more, he became more compassionate towards the poor and the disenfranchised. It was a Holy Spirit moment. And he would say today that at that time, he began to imitate Christ, to make the gospel both audible and visible. And everything about his ministry changed at that point. We've heard it said, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And that was true of Wesley. His impact began with his transformed heart, his practice of faith that was both inward and personal and public and social. We know the words of Paul written to the church at Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul says, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. So my friends, if you told your story of God's faithfulness, if we all took seriously our call to be witnesses for Jesus, would it make any difference? Absolutely. Absolutely. Whether you record your story or a snippet from that story on Facebook or in a memoir or in a message to a friend, whether audibly or visibly, God will use it to bear fruit. Our witness today could speak to a demoralized church. Why demoralized? Well, we're in the midst of a pandemic struggling to connect with people, to keep them connected with one another. Some churches are struggling financially. Some are wanting desperately to continue to engage in meaningful ministry and finding it hard because it's difficult to deploy people into places of uncertainty. It's difficult to project hope in a time that's been so chaotic. And that same witness can speak to a divided nation about the faith and hope and love that we share, our hope and faith and love in the one who makes us one. So regardless of our political persuasion or cultural affinity or any other distinguishing factor, we claim Jesus loves me this I know. And you can claim it in a song or a poem or personal experience, any way you choose. But recording your story may reinforce what you already know, as some of the same themes tend to bubble up again and again in the stories of our lives. 
for example, that God loves you, period. That God is patient and slow to anger, regardless of what you did last night. That God's grace is sufficient. That God is with us in uneventful and highly significant days. That God calls us to be witnesses for Jesus Christ to make the gospel audible and visible. Friends, let's share the story because it's a story worth sharing. God bless you.